Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation and entrepreneurship. My name is Steve Glaveski and each week I'll bring you authors, corporate innovation managers, entrepreneurs and above all else, thought leaders on the topics of innovation, entrepreneurship and self-improvement. Future Squared brings you a double dose of innovation inspiration every week to help you successfully navigate your innovation journey. Every Monday, I'll bring you a world-class thought leader such as Steve Blank, Alex Osterwalder, Neil Patel, Rand Fishkin, or Whitney Johnson, just to name a few. While every Friday, I'll bring you some quick digestible insights myself to help end your week on a high before you head off for the weekend. Future Squared is proudly brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation hub, school, and consultancy that works with large organizations to help them adopt the mindset, methodologies, and tools required to explore new business models and disruptive innovation in an era of rapid change. If your organization needs support coming up with ideas, testing and turning those ideas into reality, incubating teams, driving cultural change, or connecting and partnering with startups, then visit Collective Campus online at www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared. Today I'll be speaking with Catherine Squire. She's the General Manager of App Development and DevOps at the Australian Stock Exchange. She has over 20 years experience in exchange, investment, bank and vendor environments and previously spent over 10 years in Macquarie Bank, leading large projects from inception through to implementation to deliver complex solutions within equity markets globally. She has extensive experience in product management, change management and information technology within the finance industry. So with that, it gives me much pleasure to bring you Catherine Squire. Welcome to the show, Catherine. Hi, Steve. How are you? I'm fantastic. How have you been? Really good. Really busy, but very good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have had a look at some of the various news publications across Australia that your your face and your name has been popping up in. It sounds like there's been quite a lot of change going on at the ASX over the last, say, six to 12 months. It certainly has been. Um and just recently, we've had a lot of interest in some of the things that we've been doing. And I guess the main piece of work that I've been focusing on is um, uh, implementing, uh, well, cultural change, mm-hmm. which is sort of something that you, you can't really um, start out a poster campaign for cultural change. You've got to do it in small, tiny pieces. Yeah. And um, so we, we started with looking at our automation strategy mm-hmm. and... I, I sort of, you know, I guess injected the idea of DevOps um, so for the technology group. For, for our audience who don't know what DevOps is, can you just provide them with a 20-foot view or a 2,000-foot view rather? Well, yeah. Okay. Now, DevOps, I've said this, is not going to solve world peace, but it is about bridging the gap between development and operations. Mm-hmm. And I guess uh, it's a philosophy, right? Yeah. So it's, it's not a thing you can buy and it's it's... It's all about people, mm-hmm. it's all about culture, and there's a bit of automation in there. And in fact, I mean, there's a lot of automation. Yeah. But if you don't get the people bit right, you will fail. Yeah. And so that's, that's been, um, I mean, there's, we've probably been working about oh, 13, 14 months now. Um, and at first, just to get the initial buy-in from it was quite tricky because, like, what, what are you delivering? Like, well... Mm. Yeah, we're speeding some things up. We're we're automating our um, build pipeline. We're looking at uh, automating our infrastructure, mm-hmm. um, and it's all highly technical. So it's actually quite tricky to get that initial buy-in. Yep. But now we're starting to see real moves forward in particular systems where so we've got the underpinning sort of strategy of of you know automation and cultural change, mm-hmm. and then on top of that we pick a system, and it's what I've sort of. Uh, branded as my reboot strategy. So you pick a system and you try to take that system one giant leap forward, right? Right. So the thing is, you know, organizations that are as old as the ASX and you you have a lot of legacy technology mm-hmm. and you have to you can't tackle you can't boil the ocean basically. You need to be very strategic in the systems that you pick, um, figure out where you're going to get the most benefit from, and you also need to make sure you've got the right people on that project who can implement that change. Yeah, and it's been it's been fantastic. Like with this um, sort of system big leap program, um, we're up to our fourth system now, mm-hmm. and we're, people are getting quite excited about it. I actually had a meeting oh, probably last month with a business where they said, 
when can my system be a part of the reboot strategy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, okay. That's great. Fantastic. That's so fantastic. They're starting to come to us now to, mm. to see how um, we can help improve their system, pay down technical debt, make sure that deployments are automated, make sure that we've we've got proper strong um, test harnesses, and mm-hmm. we're isolating our system so it can be, um, you know, well tested yeah. and a part of the sort of. Uh, I guess improvements in quality and speed to market. Mm-hmm. No, that's great, and um, I think you touched on a few interesting points there. And one was about, I mean, I like to call these from bonfire to to bushfire, and I think you've um, called it um, from little circles of sanity to to wildfire, where you start with. You know, when it comes to getting buy-in, you know, go for the small wins first, go for the low-hanging fruit, set up some, you know, bonfires, if you will, establish some trust and win people over. And eventually, if you execute that correctly, you'll have what you're currently experiencing, which is people coming to you and asking, hey, how can we become a part of this? Yeah, exactly. And I'm actually, I like to call it we're making a micro move, right? Uh And the way I look at it, a micro move is a small action. And this is what I mean by cultural change. Cultural change is about multiple small actions, Mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, and this is why I think a lot of big change initiatives fail because we go in too big, we go in like from a top down approach and that's never, people won't buy it if they don't want to buy it, you Mm -hmm. know? And so it's how do you make change that's authentic? How do you make it achievable? And so that people can actually focus on that bit, feel a sense of, um, I, I guess, satisfaction in the work they're doing and pride in their work and feeling valued in what they do. And then that's the little cell of excellence. And then yep. as you create more and more little cells of excellence, mm-hmm. what you do is you expand your circle of sanity, mm-hmm. right? And that's the bit where we've got to the stage now where we've got people from other groups and other groups within technology sort of looking over the fence going, what are you guys, you know, what are you guys drinking over there? We want some of that. You know, yeah. This is uh, because it's taken off and particularly within in development and we've got real momentum where I've got my team sort of getting off the bench and, and really contributing and and feeling safe that they can offer up solutions that are, you know, maybe aren't your standard you know, bog standard solution, but, you know, Catherine, what about this? We could build this as a mini service, you know. How about calendar as a service? What about file distribution as a service? So we're talking microservices now, mm, mm. right? So it's, it's very exciting. And what I find more exciting is not, not the tech. It's the fact that everybody feels empowered. Yeah. And, and, that- and that's where the, the real real change come. Yeah, and I think once everybody feels empowered, they're obviously getting a lot more fulfillment and their jobs are more rewarding and therefore they're putting more effort into it But because it just feeds this positive feedback yeah. loop. Um, whereas if people aren't really empowered to go out and try different things, they're just going to see it as a job where they're just playing a role and ultimately that's not good for them or for the organization in the long run. No, that's exactly right. But I really, and it's funny, it's one of these things that Micro moves, the small actions, yeah. right? They are, it seems like nothing at first, mm-hmm. right? Just a small thing, a small drop in the ocean. But it soon, it, it doesn't have to involve you so closely. So my managers are now going off doing little micro moves of their own and it's just taking off. So it's, yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah, and I think that's a great lesson there for our audience that, you know, if you are looking to implement, say, DevOps or, or Agile or, or Lean product development philosophies, trying to implement that across the entire board. If you've got an organization with thousands of employees and legacy infrastructure, it's going to be hard. Try to get a team of five to implement it. And and if they do it well, then you start sharing these stories, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think the other, my initial fear also when I was starting sort of trialing in a couple of small teams Mm -hmm. was that that they would then be seen as, you know, the A team and everyone else was the B team, Uh, you know, and didn't want that to happen. So another key, Part of it is making sure that whatever wins you get, you share them and you allow other people to leverage off them and you always make sure people get the credit for the work that they're mm-hmm. doing mm-hmm. and involve everyone and be completely transparent about what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's the – because you, you definitely you – could, you could sort of fall into that trap if you're trying to run by modal. You know, mm-hmm. some teams are agile, some teams are waterfall and, you know, everybody wants to be in exciting new stuff. Yeah, and if you're not, you feel sort of disadvantaged and forgotten. Yeah, and that's, 
that will kill any cultural change. Yeah, that's fantastic. Would you say it's equally as important to perhaps, I mean, you've said share the wins, but is it important to then share the failures as well so that the rest of the organization can learn from that and that you get more return on failure? Or, or is that a tricky subject? Because yeah, people, I, yeah. Well, I feel very strongly about creating a safe culture um, mm-hmm. for, for staff. I yeah. think it's so important because um, if people don't feel safe to sort of fail, mm-hmm. then they won't innovate. Exactly. Right. Mm. So I, I, I think that talking about failures, being vulnerable and saying, I tried this, but it didn't work, and I backed away, and I've learned something there, is so important. But I actually think that that's actually really important for leaders to do that, probably more important for leaders to do that, yeah. to demonstrate their vulnerability so that people say, okay, well, I won't, I won't, I, it's okay to try things. And if I fail, I can talk about it and talk about what I learned. Yeah. And I think that's where leaders can make a real difference mm. by being genuine and, you know, not trying to always look like they have all the answers because they're human and they, they don't. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, um, not just paying lip service to failure, but actually maybe even incentivizing it or making it publicly, um, I suppose, acceptable or tolerable, um, you know, by sharing these stories um, has the indirect effect of communicating, look, it's okay if you fail small and we learn something and then we share it with everyone else and we build upon that. Yeah. Mm. And I mean... Yeah, yeah no, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, and you touched on an interesting point there as well about, you know, that top-down buy-in, um, that they've got to set the tone and, um, you know, we've got companies like Amazon who have monthly failure awards as part of their culture for people who experiment and learn something. And I believe in their case, they only qualify for the award if they ran the experiment without permission, which takes it to that next level. But how important is it to establish that beachhead um, with senior management um, when you are trying to drive these cultural changes? <laughs> I'm not sure we want to implement a monthly failure award. At the moment, <laughs> but <laughs> I do love the idea. I mean, it's, it, it is... Yeah, it's really saying senior management uh, back mm. innovation. Mm. I guess. So, um, yeah, oh, I think it's a great idea. I'm going to have to think about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you have to be careful about how you define what a smart failure is, right? As long as uh, people can still, yeah. you know, place trades and all that sort of stuff. Um, if, 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 if the system goes offline, that might be uh, constituted as a as not, not quite a oh, smart failure. <laughs> No, I don't. Th- I don't think we tolerate that at all. But I yeah. think I think we need to create an environment, particularly in development, mm-hmm. where you can actually fail, right? So yeah. you can, and and it's all about experimentation mm-hmm. and getting fast feedback. And so I, I yeah, mm. I'm, I'm all for that. And that's why I want to create. Um, well, we've been working towards it, making sure that my guys can uh, very quickly spin up environments and run tests and and build new features and. You know, if they get get new ideas, then yeah. they can have a crack at it. So yeah, yeah. without worrying about getting going through all the hoops and the processes to get it um, permissioned into an official test bed and mm. authorised by every man and his dog, yeah. what we're trying to do is create a space for innovation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I absolutely love that as well, Catherine, because. I guess that is one of the sticky points with most organizations where they try to stick a, you know, put a square peg through a round hole kind of thing where you've got all these processes that exist to maintain the status quo, make sure we don't break things, but then you try and innovate within those boundaries and it's impossible because like you said, you've got these long approval times and, and costs are high and everything else and you're probably working on legacy infrastructure. So you need to carve out your own little yeah. you know, piece of the world to, cool. to do that. that that's it. If it takes 10 days to get a hole in the firewall punched through, then you've, you've probably forgotten the idea that you had in the first place. So yeah. um, we really do do need to, to, I guess, work in a leaner, um, more, you know, giving more authority, mm. you know, to the to the guys to sort of make, you know, own, own the whole sort of environment. And that comes back to DevOps as well, so having cross-functional teams, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and building applications so that they're, supportable, they're operatable, yeah. you know, and not sort of throwing things over the fence as the next, next person or the next team has to deal with that. Yeah. Thinking about how you're going to support your system, thinking about how you're going to operate the system, how are you going to monitor and manage it. You know, thinking about your non social requirements in Sprint Zero, not towards the end of the project, you know. Mm. Um, thinking about how you're going to uh, test 
the system once you've built it. So I keep um, banging on about, you know, uh, Sprint Zero, mm -hmm. uh, designing all your test cases up front, uh, building code that's testable mm -hmm. is so important, um, making sure everything's wrapped in in APIs so that we can actually build test harnesses and mock mock it out. So yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, and these things are, are changing, and we're we're uh, you know that's what I mean by the guy step really stepping up. It's giving them permission to sort of go, yep, we're going to build top quality software here, and we're going to be a leading edge shop. Mm. Go to it. You know? Yeah, yeah. And they're all like, it's it's great. Yeah, no, and um, I guess a few things you touched on there was one, um, freedom to experiment, two, the environment's set up in a way whereby people can try lots of different things, can move quickly, and I mean, speed is essentially fundamental to success, and like you said, um, failure, if you're not f prepared to fail, then you're not going to innovate. Um, so it sounds as if yeah. you're crea you've, you've created this environment where people can place lots of small bets across different ideas, um, rather than what companies have traditionally done, which is placing a few very, very large uh, bets. Yeah, and one of, one of the things that we've got, uh, we've got our, our first just app development-only hackathon uh, next month, mm -hmm. it will be, and um, it's interesting because the, the, the goals that I, I said, you know, you know, you can experiment with technologies, solve a problem that you face within your you know day-to-day -day job, uh, yeah, have fun, collaborate. You know, there's no real rules about it. Just think about something that you want to build. Mm. And the ideas, I'm surprised, the ideas that have come back have, like, they're all fantastic. And all of them actually add business value, real business value. Mm. And so it's going to be quite an exciting day. I've got one team who are going to set up micro sprints and they're going to do like two hour sprints. Mm -hmm. um, and other, as a, you know, they've, they've picked. I guess things, you know, monitoring and managing of, of services within our environment. So it's going to actually help the lives of uh, support people because, you know, they, they have a better tool to use. And, mm. I mean, obviously this isn't productionizing things yet. This will be just proof of concept. But the ideas are fantastic. And it really surprised me. I thought some would come back and say, you know, I want to learn this new language or, you know, um, I don't know. I just, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, great. Yeah, that, that's that's fantastic. And um, you know, running those sprints, um, I think if you know Parkinson's law, right? If you give someone two hours to do something, they'll do it in two hours. Um, if you give them two months, they'll take two months, right? So, um, you know, I inter interviewed uh, Jake Knapp a little while ago on the podcast. So he was um, he's at Google Ventures, and he wrote the book Sprint, which talks about their five day sprint philosophy. And we sometimes use that here or with clients, and we, you know, condense that into one day. And it's amazing how many ideas. Um, come out of that one day and it's not so much about the quantity of ideas but the more ideas you have then you can converge on say two or three ideas that may have legs and may worth be worth exploring further. Yeah, yeah no, that's right and mm. also too creating that environment where people feel they can, you know, even if they try out a dumb idea, yeah. it's not really dumb because it might spark somebody else to add to it, add to it, or slightly change it and then it becomes actually a really great idea. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's and and you you keep building on the successes of each other, and you and you you're almost in in that day or in that you know think tank. You're mm. you're blowing holes in in arguments mm. and refining the solution, so you end up with something that's really um, on the money. Whereas if you sit there and start trying to write out requirements, and, you know, go through the whole manual process of yeah. ideation, yeah, you lose you lose something. Yeah, and, and and there is a time and place for a process, but it's perhaps once you have honed in on product market fit or problem solution fit and you just want to execute. But in those early stages, yeah. it is chaotic. Right? Innovation by its nature is chaotic. And um, yeah, I think you touched on a great point there, which is when you are in these ID, you know, innovation sessions, hackathons, it's important not to judge um, and that Maybe on day three, you can start to vote on ideas, but day one, get as many ideas as possible. Don't vote. Dumb ideas are great because, like you said, you may build upon those ideas and with a few evolutions, that dumb idea doesn't look so dumb anymore. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny. It, when I first um, got here, we talked about building um, containers, like using Docker for containers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've actually now implemented a full Docker platform. Wow. And we've, 
we've containerized our Atlassian tool stack. Mm-hmm. And one of the guys in my team was saying to me, um, said, man, Catherine, if you told me a year ago we'd you know, we'd even be talking about containers, I wouldn't have believed you. The fact that we've, you know, we've built our own platform is just amazing. Yeah. And so I think it's just that the abilities and the readings and the learnings that the guys had, they, they already had that. Mm. It's just they hadn't been given permission to, to, to articulate their ideas and what they should be doing. Yeah. So I, I think that's been the big change. It's not like anybody has a, a light bulb moment. It's just, we got out of their way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and that's uh, a. You know think, what I mean? Like, I think it's the Amazon mm-hmm. guy says that. I can't have somebody from Amazon um, said, you know, I hire smart people and, and then get out of their way. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it was either Jeff Bezos or I think Richard Branson says something similar, um, and that's so true. And I think you you kind of touched on something there, which is we can spend all the money in the world educating our people in agile, in lean product development or lean startup or whatever and but ultimately what it comes back to is the environment that's going to support their these behaviors like ex- mm. support taking risks yeah. and experimenting and putting their talents to to try new things yeah no exactly mm. um and i wanted to touch on something you've uh talked about previously which is when it comes to getting buy-in, and particularly at the ASX, what you did was you built a brand and story around your culture change ambitions in order to win key stakeholders over. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a lot of the work that I'm doing is, is you know, highly technical, complex, and, and a bit boring, really. <laughs> If you're a business stakeholder, it's like, oh, God, Catherine's getting technical again. Uh-huh. And it's one of those things that I've, I'm trying to uh, – it's very difficult to tell these stories without getting technical. Mm. But um, I touched on it with the reboot strategy. It has <laughs> simplified it. You know, we've got some, some pillars that we, we sit on top of, which is build pipeline automation, infrastructure automation, um, test engineering, and one other, I can't think of it. Oh, environment is a server. Mm-hmm. Right? So we're looking at these sort of four strategies, and then overarching is is the reboot strategy. So how we actually take the foundations and inject them into different systems as we go, and rather you know, coming back to it, let's not boil the ocean piece, how do we make you know, small micro moves to really make a difference? And the thing is, that's an understandable story, mm. right? It, it, it makes sense and, you know, people people get it. And also, too, I'm not promising the world because that can't really be delivered, you know. Yeah. Um, but over time, we, we will be able to, you know, take a big bite out of the work that, that's in front of us. Mm. And, um, and, you know, I'm hoping within the next 12 months we'll really start to be able to improve our turnaround on features, um, improve, you know, the automation that we're doing. Um, uh, and I guess uh, look at some of our architectural pieces and, you know, move more towards microservices and, um, you know, yeah, so just how we can actually build systems in isolation mm-hmm. so that you know, we can just replace pieces rather than, you know, having to do this full end-to-end test that, you know, take forever. Yeah, and uh, I think there's a great lesson in there for anybody selling anything, um, which is, you know, you can start on the sales pitch and on the technical jargon, but people just respond. People's brains respond much better to, to a story. Um, and if you can set that context first and then start going into your sales, it makes it much easier. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and it's also, too, like I... Uh, with the branding piece of that, it's 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 um, like I had the BA team come to me recently, and um, we're talking about sort of um, BDD using mm-hmm. BDD for um, a project, and and I think that that's probably the next sort of big leap for that team and for the cross functional team is how we go about start, start thinking about. Um, our requirements up front and how we build those test cases up front and have the feature list and just bang, we, we start from the test. Yeah. And um, 
and it, it was them that came to me. And what I was thinking is we could brand it under the same strategy so that when they go and try and get buy-in for this new process and mm-hmm. new, new way of doing things, everybody gets that, oh, part of the reboot, yeah, we're trying to improve things. You know, and it's, and it's a much easier sell because yeah. people understand the brand. Yeah. Yeah, basically so, leveraging yeah. off an existing brand rather than having to establish a new one within the organization. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. And, and as long as it's improving things and taking us forward, then that's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. No, that makes sense. Um, and I guess the great lesson there is, you know, again, it comes back to what we were discussing earlier. Get those quick wins on the board, associate this internal brand with change, something positive, something that's actually creating results. And then just use that brand as a springboard to bigger and, and better things over time. Um, and I, I wanted to touch on digital disruption, um, Catherine. I mean, ultimately, it means that CIOs uh, need to be closer attention to their customers and, and to their CMO. Um, not sure how much you can talk about this in particular, but keen to hear your thoughts on this and whether or not the app development team um, is engaging customers early on in, in the product development piece. Oh, no. <laughs> Actually, the application development team, um, not with internal customers, uh-huh. we do, not with external customers. Yep. But um, mm-hmm. certainly we're, we're trying to create, um, I guess, a leaner um, approach to building software. Mm. So, you know, with our business owners, as sort of the product owners as well, and we, we have... Um, put a fair bit of effort into sort of building, oh, should they build a bridge? It's not that we, we've always had a bridge, but, you know, just improving that relationship and, and, and trying to understand exactly what, you know, what is strategically important, what is tactically important. And also, too, and, and I think this is definitely the responsibility of technology people is to better articulate why certain things have to happen, you know. Mm. And building that trust relationship with the business and the product owner um, has worked really well in a, in a couple of systems where where we have their sponsorship to go ahead and you know rethink things. Yeah. And and so that closeness to our internal customer has been fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and you... I mean, I'm lucky because whenever when, oh, I spent ten years at Macquarie and um, I worked sort of opposite my customers, they were you know options traders. Mm-hmm. So. Um, you, know, you knew when they were happy and you knew, knew when they were unhappy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you, you had a, you ended up with a very real understanding of of what worked and what didn't and yeah. of their business. And that is so important if you want to build high-quality software. Mm. Um, no, that's great. And what's your... Um advice on, I mean, there's a lot of talk about digital strategy and a lot of people say there's only strategy in a digital world, right? And, you know, you've said that what you've done at the ASX is, you know, you focused on that seamless integration between new and existing systems. And for companies, um, particularly large companies in the financial services space, I mean, how do you tackle that challenge? I know you've talked about, you know, basically compartmentalizing things and having separate systems to experiment. Um, but in the long term, is it just a matter of, you know, like you said, iterate over time, slowly but surely change not only the culture but the broader infrastructure landscape as you have been doing um, over the past year or so? Yeah, I, I think um, I, I'm very wary of the giant decommissioning project. Mm. Uh, it, it, um, it, it never happens. Mm, right? Yeah. In my experience, it never happens because I don't think I've ever watched uh, or listened to this um, Andy Kite from Gartner did a presentation on decommissioning legacy applications. And it's just fantastic the way he described it because, you know, we talk about sort of, oh, we're going to take this system and replace it with this one and decommission the old one. What you <sighs> end up with is you end up with two systems, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you sort of partially replace the other one, but then you run out of cash at the end, and so, you know, okay, we'll keep the old one as well, you mm. know. And so then you build up this more and more complex environment. And so I think I think we need to move away from the concept of decommissioning a system and actually start thinking about continuous code decommissioning, right? Yeah. And it, it's a different approach to it, and it, it's saying every time you go into your code base, you refactor, you, you always leave it in a better place than it was before. And this is the other thing. 
you know, developers never delete code. <laughs> and, you know, they'll comment it out. Yeah, you know, I don't know whether, sorry, stop me if you, you know, I'm, I'm gibbering here. No, no. But it's quite funny because uh, they'll comment out code and leave it there. And so the next developer comes along and looks at it and goes, oh, that's commented out. But was that important? Was that right? There's no, you know, and it's, I think we should be simplifying, simplifying, simplifying. Right, mm. so you you constantly refactor, and less code is better. Yeah. You know, if you just less chance of defects, <laughs> mm. less lines of code. Mm. Um, but those elegant solutions mean you need to do some serious work up front in your design. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Um, so if we take that approach rather than having this, you know, multi million dollar project to sort of say we're going to decommission the system then I think it's a safer way and it's a way that's actually embedding continuous improvement. Yeah, yeah. And that ties into what you said earlier about these, you know, over-ambitious change management programs that never really work. Mm. 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 Yeah, and then and that ties in with the whole micro-move piece. Yeah. It's, you know, these are all small actions mm. by themselves. They're not that expensive. Yeah. So it's not going to hurt the business to be able to back small Mood, small mm. action, mm. right? That's but right. But over time, they build up. Yeah, yeah, and we deliver that value over time. And it's important to effectively articulate that the cost of doing um, or executing these small actions, like you've said, it's insignificant compared to the multi-million dollar um, organizational change or infrastructure decommissioning projects. Um, and it's important to yeah. for people, for decision makers, to understand that. Yeah. No, and and I think also too. Um, I mean. That, there are obviously other pieces of work with big mission where you need to do some serious analysis and of course. re-architecting, and you know there will be there will be some projects, but but it's it's more a philosophy as whenever you whenever you get into any system, you leave it in a better state, mm. you know. Yeah. And if you make a change, then you fix the the automated test at the same time, right? So mm-hmm. you you know you write your test, you make sure that you're you're not sort of. Uh, yeah, catching, bolting things on. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, and I guess I wanted to touch on blockchain, Catherine. I'm not sure how much you can tell us about this, but nonetheless, I mean, blockchain. If it works, if if it does be, if it does end up being everything it promises to be, um, you know, it could result in settlement that's close to real time. And I know the ASX um, has been doing some work with digital asset holdings to build a blockchain that could ultimately replace the clearing and settlement systems provided by the chess platform. Um, what, if anything, can you tell us about this? Well, um, I can't tell you a lot about it, but uh-huh. um, it, yeah, the proof of concept has, has passed and, and I know that the project is going well. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a couple of my guys working on it. We have an innovation lab up on level eight now, which mm-hmm. is very exciting and um, I... I at the moment, sort of, we're, they're working on pulling together all all the requirements um, that, that we would need, and you know, there's certain gates within the project, and at each gate, the project is reevaluated, and you know, as a, a go, no go, mm-hmm. and that's probably about all I can. Say. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think the technology is very exciting. Yeah. Um, I, th- I think it could be, you know, a real game changer in many industries. Yes. Yes. Um. So, so who knows? You know, it's still fairly immature. I shouldn't say immature, but I think there's a lot of proofing out. Yeah. Um, as experienced, you know, of course. In, in different industries before it sort of becomes, you know, productionizable. Exactly, and there's still a lot of commercial and technological barriers to it being adopted. Um, you know, as a mainstream application and across. And as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, Catherine, can you tell me about another successful system big leap? Sure. Um, the second one that we did, which was our first foray into external cloud, and it was basically a compute-intensive algorithm mm-hmm. that we were running on-prem, but was running pretty slow and couldn't sort of scale linearly. So, so the actual application lent itself to cloud because we wanted to scale horizontally. And so we we... We re-architect this application to be cloud fit. Like, you know, that you've got to be very particular about the applications you put in the cloud. You don't want to pick up something that, you know, just an on-prem app and mm-hmm. shove it in the cloud because it's going to cost you a lot of money and you'll mm-hmm. regret it. 
you really need to think about what applications are appropriate, and that goes from a, a data security perspective and regular, regulatory perspective as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so anyway, we chose the right application. We um, re-architected the algorithms now down to it runs in six, six and a half minutes. And because of the way it's developed, we're using AWS Lambda. And so it doesn't matter how many new clients we have of the system, it just scales horizontally. So it always takes six and a half minutes, no matter how many yeah. clients. And we, so we burst it out, we bring it back, and we've got our results. And so it's actually been um, a, you know, a, a good choice. And it's what, what I like to call a, a, a micro move to the cloud mm. um, because it's a demonstration of sort of saying, okay, we want to play with this you know, uh, new technology. And um, the team that I chose were also sort of uh, very excited about it. And so it didn't just directly impact them, like those around them sort of got quite excited about the work we're doing um, with external cloud. And so it's, it's been a great experience. And again, it's helped with that momentum for, for changing the way we do things and rethinking how we, we are um, delivering our software. And the other good thing was we, we built a, um, we put together like a virtual team across the exchange mm -hmm. um, where we picked people from different areas um, to focus on uh, just the regulatory and, and uh, security aspects of it and making sure that what we built was, you know, yeah, we went through, we, we found this wonderful person in regulatory assurance, uh, who's fabulous, and she's just been such a help for us. She's an expert in sort of data security and privacy, and she went through all the regulations for us, and we looked at any risks and mitigated them. And so it's just been a really mm. worthwhile, successful project because we thought it out properly from the beginning and picked the right application yeah. and it's helped not only if we've got the outcome where the system vastly improved but we've really got a lot of cultural sort of fire behind it. Yeah and um, I think that that's I really love that approach because it was all about fit for purpose and there's a tendency for uh, decision makers at large companies or for IT to think well to think holistically and say, well, we can't move everything to the cloud or, well, we can't have everyone running around being entrepreneurs, moving fast and breaking things. And that's not it at all. Like there are fit for purpose. There are businesses that will require people um, experiment a little bit, um, well, move a little bit faster. And there will be systems that can go on the cloud and others that we need to host ourselves. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and I also think it was our duty, like as the first team to sort of, be building a, an in-house app to go to the cloud, mm -hmm. um, it was our duty to make sure what we built was bulletproof, yeah. right? Um, because we're blazing a trail and it's so important that these first little micro moves you get, you get right. Mm, yeah. And, and, and so it yeah. continues to help, you know, when we were talking about that buy-in, it continues to help with the buy-in. Mm. So you've got a responsibility to the ongoing sort of innovation agenda and to other people in the organization who want to start innovating that if you are going to move first and you are going to take systems and put them on the cloud, that you get it right. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. from all aspects of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why this cloud working group has been, you know, very successful. So Great. it's a good approach for us, worked well for us. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I guess last question, last formal question, and then we'll get into our lightning round, um, was, I mean, what are you most proud of out of your time at the ASX? Uh, I think um, oh, there's a lot of things. I'm, I'm very proud of uh, the Docker platform that we've built, and I'm very proud of the excitement and momentum that I've created. Awesome. Um, I love that. That's great. That's a great answer. Um, well, 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 uh, well articulated, and by the by, the sound of things, um, you're definitely driving some serious change um, on a cultural and infrastructure level there. So that's fantastic. So, as I alluded to, lightning round time. Are you ready, Catherine? Oh, I guess so. As ready as you'll ever be. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> so question number one is. If you could work for any company at any stage of the company life cycle, who would it be and why? Oh, I think startup. Mm -hmm. um, 
when it's small and you you just there's so much variety and you learn the entire business and you're at the cold face of success and failure. Yeah. And any particular startup? Oh, I would have liked to have been at Atlassian. Yeah. <laughs> when it was a startup. Yeah, back when what was it? They they just set it up because they wanted to make forty k a year and you know replace what they would have made in their graduate roles. Yeah, and now. It would have been nice. Mm, yeah. What are they worth now? Like several billion dollars. Yeah. yeah. That, would have been a fun journey. <laughs> um, all right, question number two, Catherine. We, we could uh, ponder our, uh, our time with Atlassian uh, another time. But uh, um, number two would be, if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? Mm, dead or alive. Oh, that's a tough one. I think I'd have to ask Jane Austen something. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know what? I just ask her to tell me a story about her life. How did somebody become such a gifted writer mm. in 31 years? Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, that's, that's, that's just... Yeah. That's like a yeah, no, that's great. I'm sure, I'm sure you'd need a little bit of time to listen to the answer for that one. Um, and finally, Catherine... You know, you're doing some amazing things at the ASX, and I like to ask all of my guests, what do you do to stay on top of your game? Do you have any rituals or routines um, that you partake in? Uh, I'm a runner. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I go running just to relax. It calms me down. Yeah. And, yeah, it's just very meditative. Yeah. Yeah, I love, love running. Is that a morning thing or an after work thing, lunchtime? Oh, definitely morning. Yeah, morning, yeah. Morning. And then I can feel self-righteous all day. <laughs> love that, love that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I'm such a advocate of training in the morning because then you've just got this energy and buzz about you all day um, rather than, you know, getting that buzz in after work. It's kind of well, defeats, I mean, it doesn't completely defeat the purpose, but you don't get as many, as much benefit out of it, I don't think, anyway. Um, no, I don't think so. Either. Yeah. Awesome. I need a wine time, so. Yeah, exactly. Love my red wine. Um, so, finally, Catherine, where can people go to find out a little bit more about you or connect with you? Uh, LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. I'm on LinkedIn. So. Awesome. Yep. Fantastic. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you again for your time today. You've been an awesome guest, and I'm sure our audience would have taken um, a few golden nuggets out of that conversation. So, thank you again, Catherine. Great. Thanks, Steve. Cheers. Cheers. Well, that's it for my chat with Catherine Squire. I hope you enjoyed that homegrown story from Down Under. Um, As always, if you're picking up what we're putting down, we'd love it if you took just a second of your time to like, share, or subscribe to this show, either on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. And as always, if you'd like to find out more about Collective Campus, the Innovation Hub School of Consultancy based in Melbourne CBD, and perhaps download some resources such as innovation tools, blogs, podcasts, videos, or webinars, head to www.collectivecamp.us. Until next time, Future Squared out.